you know, we've talked about several things recently, and I, I want to kind of continue some that, you know, we're, we're endeavoring to, we're, we're pursuing something around here perpetually. I mean, for 16 years, we've been pursuing it, at least in thought, at least in declaration, we've been pursuing it. Now, every individual life has to make a commitment to it. So I'm sure there's peaks and valleys for everybody or even as a group. But we are sincere around here about the fire of the Holy Spirit. We're sincere around here about revival. All right. And so you know that. Now, nobody's hollering and hooping, but that's OK, because revival is not all about hollering and hooping. Sometimes people put on a show and an outward thing that kind of takes away from anything that would be true revival, where a heart has found God. Sometimes when your heart finds God, you get excited. Other times you don't get excited. Other times you just get, you just get holy. Sometimes when you get close to the Lord, you just get quiet. Sometimes when God's presence shows up in a service, it ought to just get quiet. So I've never been a big one that we all have to be, you know, saying amen at the same time and being real loud. There's times for that, but I'm not one that always expects that. I expect that sometimes when you're hearing from God, you just shut up. That was a good time to laugh. Go ahead and laugh. I mean, really, if Jesus showed up in your room or here, wouldn't you just hush? So when God shows up, sometimes it's just a holy hush that we're not real used to around here. You know, Americans especially, we get... We get scared of uncomfortable silences. But you talk to old timers and they're like, you know, we're missing something. Because used to occasionally, all of a sudden the Spirit of God would move in a service and nobody would say a word. And the preaching would end. Maybe y'all are waiting on me to kind of lead that. <laughs> where we just shut up, stop talking. But I, we need to talk about it at least so we're prepared. That we're all, you know, at least in tune with what the Spirit might do. Sometimes people think if the Spirit was here, then it's all just real loud and crazy and all that kind of stuff. And sometimes, but not always. You know, so much in the Spirit happens from the teaching of the Word. Sometimes we kind of try to separate the teaching and the preaching from the Spirit moving. When really, more than anything, this, what the Spirit's moving and doing, it happens during the teaching and preaching. You just can't see it. And so when people leave a service, they say, well, the Holy Spirit really fell in that service. And, and usually they're referring to, we had something spectacular happen. But, but every other service, really, just as many supernatural things are happening in all the hundreds of people that are present. The Holy Spirit's flowing through your heart. Things are getting worked out in you. Spiritual things are happening in you, to you, and through you. Some people are even getting physically healed, but you wouldn't know it. Some people are getting mentally set free and you wouldn't know it. Some people are just getting revelation and close to Jesus and just their love is growing toward the Lord and you don't know it. So you have to trust that the Holy Spirit moving doesn't have to be seen or felt or goosebumps or any kind of loud music or anything like that. So we just got to be prepared for those things. And uh, some of us have been in those type meetings. Some of you have a heritage and a history where you were part of stuff like that that was supernatural and that you want to see again. Because when God comes close, things happen. And that's what we're doing. We're pursuing God in the earth so we can have a piece of Him now, succeed now, and then we'll be with Him anyway forever. But by faith, we can have some mountains move now. We can have the fire of God fall now. Uh, you can have fire on top of your head right now. Just like the early disciples had some fire on top of them. Amen. So, so are we in uh, Acts? Well, you, you should be in 1 Corinthians. So let's just talk a little bit about revival. And, and even though there's lots of different aspects of revival, really what we, when we say that, what I'm thinking is we want hearts alive. I said we want hearts alive! Yeah. Revival... You know, it's a term that's not even in the Bible. You understand that. The term revival is not in the Bible. Think about it. It's not in the Bible. Uh, because God expects us to always be in vival. He never, he never really wanted to have to revive people. He just wanted to birth you and awaken you and then you stayed awake. But working with humans, people sometimes get sleepy even in their spiritual walk. So they get sleepy, you got to revive them. 
Sometimes they go to sleep completely. Sometimes they die. You got to revive them. So whatever the case is, we want to make sure that we're awakened, alive in spiritual things. And that would begin with the love walk. I mean, part of, there's a lot of little evidences of am I alive? Am I spiritually healthy? And if you're not walking in love, you're not very healthy. You following me? So you committing to the love walk is a part of revival. And until the Christian himself commits to the love walk fully, he's going to have a hard time staying on fire for God. He might be excited about knowledge of God, but he's not going to be on fire in the Spirit. Because if you're in the Spirit and you're on fire in the Spirit, the Spirit is God and God is love, so the Spirit is love. That means you're going to be so full of love that when people get next to you, it just squishes out on them. You with me? So... Evidence of the, you being in the love walk is an evidence of revival. That means you're awake. As soon as people don't hurt your feelings anymore, you're, you're, you're close. <laughs> See, it's going over real big on the edges. <clears throat> but I, I have noticed that. I have noticed that. That it's amazing that many Christians have never committed fully to the love walk. Right. To treating people perfectly all the time to never storming off to never separating friends to never breaking covenant with people and then God that's another anyway so that's not the message but just the love of God is part of this <clears throat> around here we're hoping that everybody jumps into the love commitment oh it'll make for a great fire Great holy fire and excitement, and you'll be a happier person. Part of that's committed. I mean, recognizing God does love you, regardless of your performance. So that's why we preach a lot on that as well. You got to know God's love for you, your love for Him. Your love for Him means you're, you're, yeah, everything He, everything you hear from God, it's like yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. That's I'm, 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 I'm obeying God because I love Him. I'm treating you right because I love you. First Corinthians 15, uh, but, but just get, get uh, I want to just give some more evidence of what this might look like in a person's life. First um, Corinthians 15 verse, it's speaking of Jesus, verse 3, For I delivered to you first of all that which I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen by Cephas, that's Peter, then by the twelve. And after that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep. Did you know believers could fall asleep? He's talking about death. I'm, I have a feeling he's talking about real, real physical death. They fell asleep. But anyway, I want you to see that 500 brethren at least saw Jesus after he rose from the dead. Uh, now, I want you to go back to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, verse 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem. This after Jesus said, go wait in the temple, get the power of God, then go tell the world. They returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. When they, they entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, and all, these, all the 11 here. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother, mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of names was about 120. See the difference there? Yeah. At least 500 people saw Jesus, heard his words after he arose from the dead before he ascended. But by the time the, the prayer and fasting had ended, there was about 120 or, or really, this doesn't even say how long they had been there. Uh, so it could have been in the very beginning. So those that made it to the upper room to wait for this wonderful Holy Spirit promise was 380 less than heard him. This is Jesus Christ. You'd think that he'd have thousands following him. God himself could only get 120. Uh, the point I wanted to make is, when you, when you do have a real close 
presence of God, when God comes near, the crowds don't necessarily get bigger. Revival, many times, shrinks before it grows. You got to get the, the nominal people out so that the fire can start burning. Like if you're going to build a fire from scratch, then you want to get all the wet wood off of it. Until the fire's blazing, then you can throw some wet logs in there and they can catch fire without harming the fire. So I just want you to know that you Wednesday night crowd folks, you're the dry wood. And we need you to be the dry wood. There's got to, every church would need a core who are on fire, who are committed. I mean, everybody's a but we're, 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 we're at least willing to totally sell out for Jesus. Amen. Everybody okay with that? Yes. If we don't do it, if we don't burn, 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 then people are going to suffer. Sinners are going to go to hell. Less people can be blessed by God if we're not burning bright. So what revival looks like is a whole lot of people. Or we could just simply say, those who are present are burning. Amen. To burn bright, you're going to have to do some things in your life. You'll have to cut out some of the world. You'll have to refocus. You'll have to not be strung out. There's lots of little pieces to you staying on fire. I'm just trying to motivate that you need to. Somehow you got to stay on fire. Somehow you got to catch it from another Christian. You see another Christian a little bit more happy about God than you, then you just do what they're doing. You kind of hang out. Hey, I want to go to lunch with this guy. He, he likes Jesus. Hey, this fellow, he likes to talk, he likes to witness more than me. I'm going to go hang out with him. That's how you burn, that's how fires work, don't they? You find a burning log, you put one that's not burning on it, and it starts burning. It's so simple, but it's spiritual. And because it's spiritual, it's hard. Hearing about it, it's easy. Glory to God, it's exciting, it gives us hope. And most of you sitting here with hope. That man, man, there is more of God coming. Yeah, but then tomorrow happens. And now it's spiritual. And now your flesh says, I'd, I'd prefer not to be the first one on fire. I would prefer to be the wet log and just get accidentally thrown in one day and then woof, there it goes. So real, real awakening and real liveliness in God requires a little spiritual effort. Praying in tongues daily, reading the Bible daily, committing to the love walk, committing to obedience, period, holiness, all those little things that, you know, don't usually sell big series of. We had a series on the fear of the Lord. This is part of it. We had a series in the bookstore, one of the first ones we did here at the church, or at least maybe the first year or two we did at the church. It had a beautiful cover, fear of the Lord. Uh, and there's a lot of pieces to the fear of the Lord that are very exciting. That's one, of the re that's one of the ways God gets to bless you and protect you and take care of you. And that thing collected dust after dust after dust. Tammy would have to go uh, dust it off every year or two. <laughs> Nobody would ever buy the Fear of the Lord series. One of the most powerful series we had in the bookstore, nobody would buy it. So what we have to do these days is trick people <laughs> with some cute little Facebook title so you'll watch it or read it. No. It's sad, isn't it? It's sad that nobody will buy it. If it just says love on it, it's like, I, I know what that is. <laughs> no, you don't. You don't know what story might get told. You, know, you don't know what inspiration's in there. That's true. Love, faith, hope. Humans are funny. Don't be one of those. Don't be one of those old sour face, boring humans that need to be tickled with some fancy thing before you'll watch it or, or listen. Anyway, so finally we just gave it away. Patty, though, Patty's, though, Patty's, Patty bought every single audio series we've ever had in the bookstore. She said, I want it all. 
praise the Lord, we finally sold that one. <laughs> then we finally gave a... And then... We've, we've given discount, we've got 50% off everything, you know, because we've always, we've always thought it funny that after a service, people will be fired. Man, that was awesome. And they'll go buy the CD and we'll have a whole bunch of CDs that people have purchased. We prepare it for them so you can have it. And the next week, man, man, that was great. They buy another CD and, and every other week they're buying a CD because they just, man, that was awesome. But then they go past the bookstore where there's thousands of already preached awesome messages of the past, and it's like, eh, eh, probably boring, probably boring, probably boring, probably boring. Anyway. <clears throat> okay, so the bottom line is, um, I've, always, I've always felt like this, that, you know, if I, if I was like called to, to go pastor somewhere else, then take over a church of 500 or 1,000 or whatever. <laughs> I always thought, and this was when I was, this is when I was traveling. This is when I was traveling and uh, I, I actually was offered to, to take over a, a church one time in Jacksonville, Texas. I'm like, no, I'm not called a pastor here. But I always felt like, you know what, if I did that, I, the, their, their attendance would, uh, I mean, their membership would be split in, I mean, they would lose 50% of their members the first month. Uh, because of the way I am, the way I preach, the, 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 the sincerity. You know, I, when we started the church the second, third year, we had a, a great couple that came to be, to be part of it and help us pioneer. And he said one day, he said, he said Pastor, he said, you don't, give any, you don't give us any wiggle room. <laughs> I'd never heard that term. But I've heard it since, but that's the first time I ever heard that term. I thought, wow. Well, you're probably right. I don't because I have to just stick with the Bible. And Jesus didn't give us any wiggle room. He didn't say, you know, the greatest command is love. But if you have a hard time with some people, you know, you can just, you can just love them but not like them. You know, you can do some stuff like that to try to work your way around the scripture. He just said it like it was. So we just say it like it is. And so, you know, those of you that are still here are ones that like that. Anyway, it's not a big deal, but I think that, that that does happen whenever the fire of God falls. It does separate. Amen. Jesus said, hey, the sword's going to come, and it might split a family or two. Um, so anyway, that's just kind of the nature of God coming close. So it, People are either going to be excited or mad. Smith Wigglesworth used to say that the, uh, the Holy Spirit and, and, and the gospel will either make people mad or glad. But it will never leave you the same. And if it leaves you the same, it was not the gospel. And so you need to understand that, that just because we don't have the crowd that sometimes people have, uh, doesn't mean that the right stuff's not happening. I mean, you can, grow, you can draw a crowd with a rock band. You can draw a crowd with fancy lights and smoke and, and all sorts of other stuff. You can draw a crowd with lots of religious activity. I mean, I could just get some water and start sprinkling everybody with it. it it'll draw a whole religious crowd. But it doesn't mean that God's there. It doesn't mean that that's not the approval of God. The crowds are not the approval of God. So sometimes when you're doing it right, you turn out to be just like Jesus who lost a whole bunch of people. So that's kind of the ear, one of the earmarks of revival. It will, you know, at least get some of the wet off until it can burn bright. And then, then it can cause a whole lot of others to get saved and come in. Um, matter of fact, a large group of, we could say, non-remnant people is a distraction. Matter of fact, let me mention uh, remnant. Turn with me to Romans chapter 11. The word remnant was used several times in the Old Testament, even in the New Testament, to talk about the ones that God has left over. After everybody falls away, after the whole nation doubts God, there's a remnant that still stands. After 12 spies go in and 10 come out, there's two left that trust God. So it's not always much of the group. It's always a small percentage of the group that God knows is going to stay faithful. So what we see in the Spirit-filled group, uh, the, the, those who really want to go all the way, is that there's a remnant of us. It's not everybody, but I think it's growing. Around the world, I think it's growing because of 
what's happened in the past hundred years. We've had some sincere stuff happen that didn't all die out completely. We had a healing revival and it seemed to dissipate, but there was left a remnant. We had a charismatic renewal where people got filled with the Holy Spirit and it was the talk of the day. I mean, it made news headlines everywhere, secular news headlines, that people were leaving denominational churches by the droves to get filled with the Spirit. Great conventions began and take, taking over the conference centers everywhere. And there was a mighty move of God getting people filled with the Holy Spirit. And then that kind of died down a little bit. And then we had this teaching movement where revelation of God's Word came alive to the, to the multitudes like never before. And, and now that teaching move kind of subsided, but there's always a remnant left. And so now we've got these remnants who have decided not to leave their heritage and we're going to build the fire. And it's happening. I mean, it's already happening. There's revival happening. There's fires of God all over the world that are bigger than we even know of. And so all, all I know for us is we're going to be part of that. Amen. We're not like the leader of everything. We're not the champion that everybody's going to write books about. We're just going to make sure we're doing our part. Yes. Yes. But there's ingredients to it that somebody needs to convey and others need to pick up on and say, yes, I, I'm in. Right. Amen. And so that's kind of what's going to happen here. What's it going to look like? I have no idea. I, I do know this. It's going to look like this. This is what revival around here is going to look like. It's going to look like this young lady right here on the front row is on fire for Jesus. Amen. And nothing's going to move her away from it. And she's going to impact everybody around her. That's all. That's all it is. I'm happy. If, if that happens, I'm happy. Amen. Oh, but then it's going to happen to you. Same thing. On fire for Jesus. Close to God. Filled with the Spirit. Oh, but that's not it. It'll happen across the aisle. That's what revival is going to look like around here, where we're so on fire for God that the kingdom of God Glory. is advancing Glory. and functioning just as God planned. Amen. Are we in Romans? Yes. Chapter 11. Yeah. Now this is talking, Paul's talking here about God casting away Israel because they didn't believe and uh, the Gentiles now had the, the Holy Spirit and God opened up to everybody. The question was, well, did God cast away Israel? And Paul's answering that question basically saying, well, no, he didn't cast away Israel. But here's the context. And we can, we, I want to apply this to today, not just Israel or Jews, but just to the church today. I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. For I'm an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away His people whom He foreknew. Or do you not know what the Scripture says of Elijah? How He pleads with God against Israel, saying, Lord, they've killed your prophets and torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what does the divine response say to Him? I've reserved for myself 7,000 men who've not bowed the knee to Baal. Even so then, at this present time, there's a remnant according to the election of grace. Stop there. I just want you to see that term. There's a remnant today. So remember what God had to tell Elijah. Here he called down fire, burned up uh, the, the, the altar, and then he killed 850 false prophets of Baal. Remember that? And then he got scared because Jezebel was after him. It's amazing how women can get, I mean, men can get so scared of women. And he runs out to the wilderness to hide and he's depressed and he's all, and God says, what's wrong with you? I, don't you? I got a remnant for you. That's the whole, that's what the context was. I got a remnant for you that haven't bowed to Baal. You're not the only one out here yeah. that loves Jesus. Right. <clears throat> I mean, he didn't love Jesus, but he, anyway, you get the point. Applying it to today, you're not the only one that loves Jesus. You're not the only one that wants to see revival. And so we're together in this. Amen. How many of you want to see something happen? How many of you want to see God take over the next life? Yes. How many of you want to see some miracles? Yes. How many want to see uh, just some people fall down and repent and turn to God? Yes. How many of you want to people, uh, see people just not be so worldly anymore? Yes. Okay, so that, that's it. That's what we're doing. We're, we're here because there's a, we're, the, we're going to be a remnant that God can use and that God can flow through. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> 
and that's why we're going we're gonna to stick to what makes the church succeed strategy. Not just come up with gimmicks to attract more nominal people. There's a lot of ways you could attract more nominal people to come to church and have a bigger crowd. But then they would start distracting us. They would have all these demands of what they wanted church to be like, and we're not doing that that way. You know, you could get, if we would just cut our, listen, if we would cut our church service to one hour, there'd be tons of people coming. Over time, there would be tons of people coming. All the guests would begin to stay rather than only a percentage. A higher percentage would begin to stay because it's easier. We've heard of several, many people who like the church, but it's so long. I just can't do that. We go to the other church because it's short. It's the truth. So we could have a bigger crowd if we just cut our church services to one hour. But then it would ruin the fire. They don't get to tell us what to do. Those who... Those who are disinterested in the things of God do not get to dictate what happens in church. Amen. And we're, we're committed to that. So you need to know that. And that's just one of the things. There's other things that p- churches are doing to try to attract a crowd. And, and, and you know, they're, they're getting some people saved here and there, but there's a little risk in that. Because whatever you do to get people, you got to do to keep people. So if you have all these gimmicks and all these things that attract uh, babies and the careless, disinterested people, then as soon as you stop doing those things, they're going to leave. That was an old saying, you know, concerning the youth. Whatever you do to get them, you got to do to keep them. So if you're going to create carnivals every time uh, a church service happens for for the youth to want to come, then as soon as you stop the carnivals, they're done. Because they didn't get saved into the holy presence of God. They got saved into this little... Carnival atmosphere. So the church has gone through a lot of iterations of that, trying to see what works and see how we can impact the world. And let me just tell you, the way we impact the world is the way that Jesus and the apostles impact the world. And it's the best way, and it's really the only way, in my opinion, that we're going to do it with the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, and that's it. We're not going to create a whole bunch of extra things that the world wants, that the other people need, because it's not good enough for me. It's not real. It's not the glory of God. The Shekinah glory of God happens because of certain key ingredient elements that you find in the book of Acts. Whether it's the love of God or being in one one accord or whether it's the Holy Spirit or whether it's uh, continuing together in the apostles' doctrine and in prayer or whether it's just simply prayer. You follow me? So, turn with me to John chapter 6. Somebody said once that when you spend energy attracting the mildly interested, you compromise the entire vision. That's one reason I, I, I don't like to... Okay, let's say it this way. There's, we're, we're in pursuit of some real powerful things, okay? Well, I, as you can tell, it ain't all that easy. Well, how come we don't see what we... Well, it's not easy. I mean, it, it does take some, some faith. It takes some people that step out in faith and start flowing in gifts of the Spirit. Uh, and so, hey, we're endeavoring to get there. We're doing our best, okay? Or we're, we're expecting to do our best. I'm sure we could all do a little bit better, but we're expecting to do our best. We want to lead more people to Jesus. We want to see more miracles, more people healed, all that. Uh, but what happens once you make that decision, what do you do in between then and seeing what you want to see? Well, here's the thing a lot of people have done. When you're not seeing kind of what you thought you might or whatever, all of a sudden you create new things to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we got this downtime. Let's fill it with something that entertains us. I can't do that. I've never been able to do that here. Just because we're not quite seeing everything we want to see, I'm not going to create distractions just to fill time. Our church services, I believe that we're doing what's necessary in church services. I know pretty much everything everybody's tried. 
So I'm sure that people come to church and are like, how come they don't do this in church? And how come they don't have a thing for this? And how come they don't have a thing for that? I've considered all of it. And the things we're doing here is what I have found actually works and creates healthy disciples. I'm not saying we're perfect. Hey, there might be something that could be great. But at the same time, we're not rookies. We're not just neglecting something that could be going on here that other churches are doing and it's so wonderful. We're not just neglecting it because we don't know. Mostly it's because we've decided that's not what I want to put any kind of faith energy into. Okay? <clears throat> and there's a list of things. I'm not going to list them. You can get the picture, right? <clears throat> John chapter 6 here, Jesus did another thing where he does this. He does this. He, he'll, he'll, he'll weed out so that he can, <clears throat> you know, like it, if you're not rowing the boat, man, you're just weighing it down. So we got to get everybody rowing. Uh, so somebody needs to... Not this crowd. I'm just talking about in general. Everybody here is all fired up rowing. I'm sure you are. Yeah, you are. Okay. But this is in this conversation. John chapter 6, verse 32. Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is He who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So the, the thing that feeds people is Jesus. Amen. The Word of God. The living Word of God is what everybody needs. And that's why a church must have the Word of God being fed and received longer than 23 minutes. Come on. Amen. That's right. It's the only thing that causes any spiritual success. It must be given time to. Amen. And all this business about I don't have time except for I can only reserve one hour for God a week is ridiculous. Anybody that found Jesus knows it's the dumbest statement and thought anybody's ever had. You just can't get what you need with just 23 minutes of God's Word given in a milky way so that no, nobody will leave if it's too hard. Look around here, the gospel we preach crushes people. But in a good way. We, we need all of our stupidity crushed. We need our carnal self crushed. I mean, the gospel should crush selfishness. It should crush the flesh. That's the best way to say it. The gospel we preach should crush the flesh. The gospel should never make your flesh happy. Did you know that? It says... The spirit lusts against the flesh and the flesh lusts against the spirit because the two are contrary to one another. That if you walk in the flesh, you cannot please God. The, the flesh hates the gospel. There's nothing about your flesh that says, I want to go to church. Well, except Donut Day. <laughs> I like, I like Donut Day so much that I, I have suggested, hey, should we do it every week? And everybody's like, no, no, don't do it every week. And, and, and I agree. I agree because I don't want to get people coming because of donuts. You see how subtle some of this can be? Well, people would love to bring their coffee in the sanctuary. And I think, I like coffee. I might want to have some coffee up here. That would be fun. But then I think, no, that's the wrong reason. What if the Holy Spirit did move? All the coffee would be spilt. We can't afford that. But it would get a bigger crowd to want to be here. I mean, some churches in, in the past 20 years have, have built pews with cup holders for their coffee. It sounds okay. On one hand, it's like, well, what's the big deal? It's just God. It's just church. Yeah, but it does something. And this is arguable. I'm not, you don't have to agree, but it does something. It, it, it makes it more casual. It, it just takes away some of the fear of God. It, it's just my living room. And it's just a little different. When you come in an assembly, things are different. Isn't that right? 
So we're trying to, we're committing to these things. Anyway, but we do like Donut Day and that's okay. Matter of fact, it's okay to have fun. We can do games. We can do fun things. Matter of fact, you you need to be such a skilled Christian that you can be right in the middle of the funnest pizza party of all. Enjoying it. There's no sin involved. You know, pizza and Coke is not a sin. (laughs) And partying, Christian style. And, and then all of a sudden somebody comes in with a spiritual need or a sinner comes in to deliver that pizza and all of a sudden we just turn, turn off the flesh for just a moment and get them saved. Praise the Lord with them. God bless you. Bye-bye. We turn back on the fun. Somebody comes in with a prayer request right in the middle of when I'm about to win the game. And we should be developed enough to say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Everybody stop. Let's take care of this person. And then as soon as it's taken care of, we get right back to the fun. So we're not saying you can't enjoy the world to have, I mean, you can't enjoy living in this world to have revival. No, you can, but you got to have it in in check. You got to have your priorities straight. Praise the Lord. It's been fun since we, you know, we built this, when we refurbished this church, we made the decision, hey, we've just built this out. Are we going to allow drinks in the sanctuary? Anything but water. And I just presented the question and and everybody with the consensus was, no, we're not. And I was kind of glad because I didn't have to be the one. I could just blame everybody else. (laughs) It's not the pastor that decides everybody else. (laughs) Got to be smart about these things. So this is the context of Jesus talking about how the bread of life is the only way you're never going to live. You're not going to have any light if you don't have the bread of life. So then he says, I am the bread of life. Verse 41, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. And then verse 48, I'm the bread of life. He said, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven and that one may eat of it and not die. I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he'll live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Verse 52, the Jews therefore uh, rejoiced greatly because they could eat it. No, the Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, how then can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I'll raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. For he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the man and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. Verse 60, therefore many of his disciples when they heard this said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It's the Spirit that gives life. The the flesh profits nothing. The words I speak to you are spirit and they are life. But there's some of you who don't believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who who didn't believe and who would betray him. And he said, therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it's been granted to him but my father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. It's interesting. Jesus preaches this short little message. We don't know exactly how long. This is the recording of it. And lost people. And it's interesting that he didn't go chase them down. Wait, well, I didn't really mean that you got to eat. No, no, let me explain. Let me explain. He didn't even do that, did he? He expected them to catch it. He expected them to acknowledge at least what they'd seen with him and heard from him and say, you know what, I'm going to stick with you anyway. I don't know what you mean exactly, but I'm going to stick it out anyway. Amen. No, he didn't have any problem filtering out the wet wood. Then Jesus said to the twelve, do you also want to go away? He gave them a chance. He gave the disciples a chance. Do you want to go away too? We're not offering that chance. You have to stay. The doors are locked, you know. (laughs) But Simon Peter answered and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Just want you to see that revival sometimes shrinks before it grows. Make sense? It's hard to work with people that aren't together in things. And so we're all expecting, we're expecting everybody here 
It loves God uh, as much as they know how to. And that you're willing to commit to 100% love of God around here. Hallelujah. But what about the seekers? What about those who aren't saved or aren't in? What do we do? Do we turn down the fire so that they can handle it? Do we turn down Holy Spirit stuff so they can handle it? No, we turn it up. So you, I know how it is. You bring a guest to church and it's like, ooh, I sure hope sister so-and-so doesn't do her little thing. Ugh, oh, what am I going to say? And so you prepare your guests before they get here. Now, there's a lady and there's a guy and you never know what's going to happen, but I'll just let you know everything's going to be. And that's okay. Hey, hey, I, I say prepare people. Prepare them if you want to. Follow the Holy Spirit. But we're not going to tone things down just so people that, don't, that aren't that interested can get interested. No, let's turn up the heat and let them fall on their face and say, I'm interested. Yeah. There's no way that we can pull back on what we know of God. You understand? Amen. Just to get more people coming. Can't, we can't pull back on the Word preached or Holy Spirit manifestation. We, we just can't pull back on it. Okay? Now, this does not mean that we all have a license to just be crazy. I think there's some wisdom that needs to be used so that we do it very spiritually and efficiently, scripturally. Even Paul addressed some things that were a little off course here. So it's not a license to just do anything you want to do in, in the name of, oh, we're just going to stay on fire for God. No, let's consider people. Let's consider impacting people. It says let everything be done in church service to edify everybody else. Whatever you do, do it to edify everybody. At home, you can do anything you want to do. At home, you can put stickies on your hands and feet and crawl around the ceiling. You can do anything you want to do. You can worship God any way you want to worship. You can, you can be as, as strange as you want to be at home. But when you come to church, uh, there is consideration of who's next to me. The tone that I have must be considered. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to uh, disturb everybody around me with my self-indulgence. Now, if the spirit moved in some dramatic way, or you were really getting touched, or blessed, or delivered in that moment, uh, that's a different story. Hey, fine, fine. We've had some stuff happen. It's like let them, let them go. Just everybody, just hush for a while. Let them go. Let them go. That's fine. That's fine. But if it's a pattern, then it might be just self-indulgent, and you need to check that, right? Yeah. So we do trust that you'll grow and learn, but there's a lot of mercy. We have a lot of mercy on people, um, but we just ask that you do have some wisdom. So I think that if we want to have a move of the Spirit, we will have to be okay with certain flesh extravagancies. We have to be prepared. for. If you want to have a move of the Spirit, you should be prepared for the flesh to have some extravagancies every once in a while. Because we can't promise that, no, that everybody's mature. And we're trying to step out in the Spirit. And you know, you know, as you start learning some of these things, you try a couple things and it didn't really work. Well, you got to try. You can't do nothing Amen. saying, well, if the Spirit wanted us to do something, He would just push me in. He'd push me over. He would make me do this. He'd make me speak in tongues. He'd make me, make me, make me. Uh, no, it doesn't work that way. You have to follow the unction and step out. And sometimes people step out at the wrong time or in the wrong way. And it's like, yeah, okay, well, that didn't really bless people. And it kind of, kind of felt funny about doing that, so I won't do that anymore. But we have to be okay with certain extravagancies. You with me? Now, around here, we do our best to, to kind of squelch those uh, pretty quickly, but not in a rude way, hopefully. You following me? I'm just being candid with you. Because so you, so, we got to know what to expect. I mean, hey, when the, some of the old timers would preach, people would just fall out in their chairs. Other people would end up in trances in the front. And, 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 and it would scare people. And then there was skepticism. Hmm. Well, I don't know about that person going up to the front. They got into a trance. You know, they just stood there for two hours. <laughs> Couldn't even pay attention to the message. And, <clears throat> and, and, and the, nobody knew what was happening, really. And so they just said, well, hey, when they come out of it, let's just see who they glorify. Let's just see what happens. And they would come out of it and they would glorify Jesus or something. And they'd say, well, it must be of the Lord. 
And then they'd talk about the vision they had or whatever. So there's some things that are startling to us, but are of the Lord. There's other things that kind of seem a little fleshy. We'll trust the Lord works that out and that, that it doesn't affect us. Right. You with me? And, you know, we, we, we'll, we'll do our best if you do bring guests, which... <laughs> hey, listen, I, I know that when you start coming to Spirit-filled church, it's like, I'm not going to invite any of my people for a while. <laughs> it's the truth. And, you know, if they're not ready, but, but do your best not to think too hard about it. Amen. Try to follow the Spirit in it. Don't, don't try to, because sometimes you think that the, the most carnal person or the, the one you think might, might not like it will like it the most. Because it has to do with hunger. Really, when, if you find somebody that's even slightly hungry for God, that's the one. But then again, I say you bring them all and just let them get the seed. Let them see the tongue and interpretation that happened. And oh my gosh, that freaks me out. Let them see it. Let them see it. And God can work on that. So we're not going to think about that. Let's not get mental about who's going to accept it and who's not. That's not your business. Let's just burn the fire and, and throw people in. If they don't like it, ah, they can leave. Remember in Luke chapter 18 when the rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, what do I need to do, Master, to have eternal life? Jesus said, you've got to keep the commandments. He said, I've been doing that, you know. And he started listening to the commandments. He said, yep, done that from my, from my childhood. Jesus said, there's one thing you haven't done. You need to sell all your stuff, give it to the poor, and then you can come. <laughs> the fellow wanted God. He wanted eternal life. I mean, people do want God. But then as soon as they recognize there's some commitment in this walk with God, they disappear. He went away grieved because he had great, great possessions and Jesus did not chase him. Oh, but if he would just understood, if he just understood more, of always, if he just understood, then I could explain to him that, it, that sister so-and-so isn't all that bad. I'm not picking on any ladies here. There's no sister that I have in mind when I use that example. It could be anything. It's usually the pastor anyway. It's the pastor. It's the... It's the pastor's wife. Usually it's the pastor's wife. <laughs> She's usually the problem. I need your help to keep the devil off my wife, that's for sure. <clears throat> Whatever the devil will do to disturb and distract and deceive people. Uh, well, no, no, I just can't handle that. I can't handle that. Look, the Holy Spirit will take care of it, all right? There will be people that need to go because the commitment's too heavy. And we're not, we're not forcing commitment, but the gospel requires it. To be a true disciple, it does require this, this, this consecration. To really touch the Spirit of God, you've you got to believe. And if you believe, you'll obey and all that kind of thing. You understand what I'm saying? <clears throat> Hallelujah. Okay, one final scripture and we'll be done. Second Chronicles chapter 7. Second Chronicles chapter 7. That's in the Old Testament. Are the pages stuck together? I preach more from the Old Testament if the New Testament didn't have so much in it to preach. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven and I'll forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made here. Okay, now stop there for just a second. This is talking to the nation that had a land. All right? Now listen, you and I don't have a land. Okay? So it's hard to take this scripture and apply it perfectly to any country. The way we apply it is to the church. If you will humble yourselves, seek my face and pray, turn from wicked ways. I would say this needs to start in the church. Repentance begins in the house of God. Don't be worried about American officials. 
American officials are not going to squelch revival in a church. They will not. What we're in need of is not a country type thing. It's a church thing. We'll talk about the country after we do the church. After we get the church where we want it to be, then we can, do fur we can go further. But right now, think of it this way, that it's first my, my own heart. Humble myself and, seek, and turn from my wicked way. And then the church itself needs to think this way. So don't, don't cast off the responsibility to outside forces. Yeah, it's, the, it's all this more immorality in the country. If we would just, as a country, look, that's not how any revival ever happened in the history of the church. Jesus did not need the Roman government to start acting right. Amen. The apostles did not either. None of them even mentioned anything about lands or governments or anything. You understand? What what they do? They just had revival. They stayed together in the apostles' doctrine. They got people saved and healed. Baptized them. Filled with the Spirit. Moved on to the next city. Moved on to the next city. Moved on to the next city. Everybody okay with that? <clears throat> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So we are going to have to pray. We are going to have to humble ourselves. Humility is part of keeping revival going. And that's always... That's always one of the things that ends a revival is that people begin to feel, hey, look what we did. Hey, we're the ones that God has used. People start doing that. Even individuals, Christians start getting used by God and, huh, let me tell you how to do it. I've been there. I mean, we've, we've all kind of been there. We found God. It's like, hey, and that's okay. You need to edify and help people, show them how to get where you've got, but don't get a big head about it. Stay humble. Always stay humble. Matter of fact, most of the revivals of the past ended because somebody stepped up too high in pride. I had examples to tell you, but we've run out of time. So, Unless you want to hear one. Some of our, our great, great pioneers of faith who did wonderful things, and I love them as brothers, and teach their stuff, and preach their and testify of their miracles and talk about how they found God. Dear to my heart, brothers, I've seen on video, uh, at the end of their ministry and lives, got into sincere, I mean, severe pride and many times thought they were Elijah who was to come. <clears throat> and uh, died a premature death because they never could get out of that thing. They were used so mightily by God and the devil deceived them into thinking they were something they weren't and just fell flat. And it's more than once, more than once. So there, there are some cases where we recognize, hey, be prepared. Even on the individual level, let, let's not get a big head about anything. Let's always stay humble about everything. Sometimes people get filled with the Spirit and they make everybody feel so bad. You know, all the people that don't believe in the baptism of the Spirit, we make them feel less. No, you don't have to do that. There's another way. There's another way. There's a way to, to throw breadcrumbs and say, hey, man, if you want it, come on. Come on, man. Without, making them, without condemning people. So there's a lot of wisdom that it takes to win the world, you see. Keep the fire. Wisdom, it takes wisdom to keep the fire burning. Build the fire, keep it burning, and then win the world. He that wins souls is what? He that wins souls is It's wise to win souls. And the one that wins souls is wise. It takes wisdom to win souls. Thank you for joining us for the preaching of God's Word. We trust that your faith and your love for God is stronger than ever before. More information about Stevenson Ministries and Houston Faith Church is available online at HoustonFaith.tv. Chaz and Joni Stevenson are the pastors of a dynamic, growing church in Houston, Texas, and have a New Testament vision of preaching the uncompromised Word of God with the power of the Holy Spirit, helping people get saved, and building strong Christians who can impact their world. Houston Faith Church is a place where the love of God is real, where lives are changed, and where followers of Jesus become fishers of men.